This is CBC Here and Now. Well, they were expected home yesterday afternoon. Tonight, crews end the search for two missing fishermen near Gross Morn. Money doesn't compensate, but harm was done to them. They have suffered losses and the courts found they are entitled to this financial compensation. After more than a 20-year fight, the Catholic Church is found liable for abuse suffered at Mount Cashel. Well, I hope you like below seasonal temperatures because that's the story for the next few days. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin with a tragedy near Gross Morn. The search for two missing fishermen has come to an end. The body of one man has been recovered. A second man was found alive in the water. Here now's Troy Turner has tonight's top story. It's been a quiet, somber day here in Sally's Cove, just north of Rocky Harbor, as this community and indeed this entire coast mourns the death of 49-year-old Todd McLean. McLean was from Green Island Cove. He was fishing with another man from his hometown when he was reported missing last night. Canadian Coast Guard and search and rescue personnel answered the search. Unfortunately, the body of McLean was found this morning at around 10.30. The other man, a 29-year-old, was found alive at around the same time. McLean has been fishing out of Sally's Cove for years. In fact, his family has fished out of this area for decades, so he's no stranger to the people in this area. People are quiet here today, saying it's too soon to talk about this. However, there's definitely a sense that this community, and indeed the whole Northern Peninsula, is in mourning today. McLean leaves behind a wife and two daughters. Troy Turner, CBC News, Sally's Cove. A landmark ruling today for victims of the Mount Cashel Orphanage. The province's Court of Appeal has overturned a previous Supreme Court decision ruling that the Roman Catholic Episcopal Corporation of St. John's does have to pay damages to abuse victims. Mount Cashel was a haven for abusers. Christian Brothers unleashed vicious physical and sexual assaults on orphaned children, crimes that would go unpunished for decades. Today's ruling means the local archdiocese is vicariously liable for the abuse victims suffered at the hands of the Christian Brothers. A previous judge decided that more than $2.6 million in damages is owed to the four survivors in the case. The group is represented by lawyer Jeff Budden. For these four men in particular who've been through a trial, uh, they obviously feel uh, a real sense of relief and satisfaction. For the, uh, the group as a whole and their families, they, they have similar feelings. Uh, relief that this legal process has, uh, subject to an appeal, come to a conclusion. Uh, and satisfaction that the court has found that the archdiocese is, is liable to them. Uh, I don't think anybody sees this as any kind of fair resolution. However, how else can we do it in our society other than saying, look, harm was done to you, uh, both the suffering, the, what you went through, and also the impact on your lives, on your careers. And we had a lot of evidence at trial from psychologists, from economists, from the men themselves about how even though they had good productive lives, uh, they felt their lives were not what they could have been. So uh, even though we had gentlemen who had, in some cases, quite solid careers, they still felt, look, uh, I accomplished things, but what might I have I accomplished if I hadn't been uh, laden down with this, uh, this burden? So the uh, no, money doesn't compensate, but harm was done to them. They have suffered losses, and the courts found they are entitled to this financial compensation. around American military members and whether or not they have to isolate when they come to this province has been cleared up. According to the province's health minister, there is now no room for misinterpretation. Here now as Mark Quinn explains. Anyone who's coming in here from outside the bubble or especially from the United States, which as we know is much more of a hotbed than Canada is at this point, 
uh, should have to 100% self-isolate. Chef Chris Mercer says his number one priority during the pandemic is the safety of his family of four. So he had a lot of questions and concerns yesterday when he heard about American military members coming to St. John's and not self-isolating. You kind of wonder what happened at the border to make this possible to the point where they thought it was okay to kind of go around town. I heard they're at at least a couple different establishments in the downtown area. Today, Newfoundland and Labrador's health minister explained there was a misunderstanding, confusion that needed to be set straight. This was a misinterpretation, a failure of communication, if you like, uh, whereby the servicemen uh, misunderstood instructions. Uh, those from CBSA were somewhat more ambiguous than ours, uh, and uh, that left them with what they thought was leeway to do what they did. Uh, we have corrected that. Now, Haggy says exactly what's expected of visiting military personnel has been made crystal clear to everyone, including federal officials and even local hotels. They get off the plane, they go to their billet, to their hotel, they stay there and they reverse the process the following day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, without 14 days of isolation, they are not free to do anything else. Mercer hopes the next step will be clear enforcement of the rules. If there's not being enforced at the beginning, at the point of the border, at the point of entry, then there's just it's just chaos because anyone can go anywhere, anyone can lie about where they're coming from or where they've been. And we, as a restaurant, we're not prepared to be able to identify who's not, who's supposed to self-isolate, who's from away, who's, you know, who's a local, who's from the bubble. It's, we're not prepared for that. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, health officials have highlighted masks as one of the best ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19 when you can't keep your distance. On Friday, masks will be mandatory in Nova Scotia for anyone inside a public building. And that may happen in this province. Here and now's Peter Cowan joins us live with more. So Peter, what are officials here saying about that? Carolyn, making these non-medical cloth masks mandatory has been a growing trend that we've seen in various cities and even provinces uh, in the rest of the country. The question is, should we be doing it here? Well, in Nova Scotia, they're requiring them to make sure that people start using them as a habit. With the talk that a second wave could come in the fall, they want people to get used to wearing them. The focus is going to be on education, not issuing fines. Quebec has made a similar move, and so have other large cities like Ottawa and Toronto. The big difference there is those places continue to see new cases of COVID. Dr. Janice Fitzgerald says right now they're weighing the pros and cons of making masks mandatory here. She says there are clear benefits, but there are also some drawbacks. When masks are most effective is when we have higher prevalence in the community. Um, so we certainly um, wouldn't want mask fatigue to develop, before, you know, and then end up with a higher prevalence uh, and, and people not be wearing masks or not want to wear masks. So that's something we have to consider. Uh, but it is something we're actively looking at at this point um, as to whether or not and we should do that and when, if we decide that we should, when we would be the best timing to do that. Um, but the decision isn't uh, final at this point. Now, anecdotally, there are lots of people who aren't wearing masks in stores in and around St. John's, and even though they're not mandatory, Fitzgerald is still recommending them any time you can't keep that two-meter distance apart from other people. It certainly is not going to harm you to wear a mask in public if you're not sure. So if you're going to a grocery store and you're not sure if you're going to be able to physically distance for the whole time that you're there, put a mask on before you go in. Um, take it off after you leave. It's, uh, you know, it's a very small step. It takes a matter of seconds. Uh, it, could, uh, it could really uh, prevent spread of the disease. So, um, you know, if, if in doubt, put it on. So in the U.S., whether to wear a mask has become a very political issue, but Fitzgerald says the debate within her department is entirely focused on the health benefits and drawbacks. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. That's here and now's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, according to the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, thousands of small businesses in Newfoundland and Labrador are at risk of closing because of COVID-19. The group says the future depends on how the province proceeds. 
According to its report, 60% of businesses in this province have fully reopened since the COVID shutdown. Meanwhile, the Federation says one in six businesses is considering winding down or going bankrupt. Applying that figure to businesses here, CFIB estimates 2,735 small companies in this province could close down. It's going to be a combination of government support and certainly customer support. On the customer side, yes, we appreciate that it's consumer choice and um, you know people have a people can choose where they spend their money and that kind of stuff. That's that's appreciated. What we would encourage consumers to do, though, if they have a chance or if they're trying to think about purchasing something or some service, give a small business owner a chance. Well, coming up in about 20 minutes on Here and Now, my full conversation with Vaughn Hammond. Well, the provincial government may make changes to your pension. It's holding consultations to explore the possibility of unlocking pensions, giving some earlier access to the money they saved. Here and now's Garrett Barry is live tonight at Confederation Building. So, Garrett, what brought this on? Well, Finance Minister Tom Osborne says he gets calls about this possibility every year, and those calls are only getting louder now that so many families are facing financial distress during the COVID-19 pandemic. The idea here is to let, as you said, some people facing immediate financial distress or need get access to that little bit of money they have saved in their pension. But this is pretty thorny territory and the provincial government today with their announcement is only dipping their toes into these waters announcing in effect their intention to start thinking about this it's a very complex issue um if you've got a rush on uh, uh, cashing out pensions it could affect the liquidity of the of a pension plan um if you cash out your pension uh, the money that was supposed to be there for you in your golden years, uh, you're utilizing the day. Um, so we're, we're looking at a balance. Osborne says other provinces already allow this, but the proposal is already facing a little bit of pushback from an advocate who has seen his share of pension fights. He's skeptical of any changes to pension plans and says in this case, there is a possible downside if people take from their future to pay for right now. Uh, they're finding it hard to make ends meet, and of course they will try to get money anywhere they can, and I can fully understand this. But we hope that this COVID pandemic is going to be over after a few months or a few days or a few weeks, whatever the case may be. But the poverty pandemic that they're going to put themselves into by t doing this type of thing now is going to extend down for the rest of their lives and make their lives much, much worse than they ever were. Morris says the poverty issue needs to be fully dealt with in society and it cannot be done, according to him, by asking people to borrow against their future. Today, we also spoke to a financial advisor. Larry Short says there are risks at the extremes of this possibility, but for most people, the system can work. So this is a really good idea. Um, it removes uh, people in some cases from social services, from welfare, and allows them to access the savings that they've had uh, built up over the years. And it is available in many other provinces. If you have a federal plan, there's a provision for this. If you are in Ontario or Alberta or Manitoba, there's also a provision for it. But in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's very restricted. Osborne was pretty careful today. Uh, he declined to say much about how this system could work if implemented. Rather, he's leaving that to the consultation table. Best consultation is actually online available right now. It's open for feedback tonight and will continue until September. Garrett Barry, CBC News, St. John's. Now to a story about overcoming the odds. Five years ago, Brandon Chase suffered a traumatic brain injury when he survived a near deadly car crash in Alberta. The driver of the other vehicle was drunk. Brandon returned home to Newfoundland and now shares his story with young people, telling them about the dangers of drinking and driving. CBC's Malone Mullen and Mark Cumbie bring you this story. 
Brandon's speech and his uh, his uneven gait often is mistaken for him being drunk or stoned. And I've seen him, him have that reaction. So when he goes up to approach people in the park or wherever it could be the mall, I often, you know, I, I don't want him to be rejected. I fear for his rejection. I feel badly for him. Brandon has assured me that that rejection does not hurt him. He said, Mom, I got hit by an SUV. There's not a lot that I'm afraid that can hurt me right now, so. I just had to, sometimes I go up to people and tell my story and to drink and drive. I used to be a spokesperson for, uh, I volunteer for uh, Mothers, Against, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and uh, to tell people not to drink and drive. And it's a very important message. And some people, you know, are busy and whatnot and they, they don't want to hear that message, but it's a very important message, right? So I, I like to tell people anyways, regardless if they don't want to hear it or not. The trip's okay. Please don't, don't drink and drive. And I say that because over five years ago, I got a very bad car crash in Alberta. Brandon was a huge lover of sports. Football, baseball, basketball, hockey, and he played rugby. Uh, he, with his six foot five frame, I was always concerned he was going to crack off playing rugby because rugby is so rough and it just used to make me cringe. But uh, he loved it, he played it. and I think a lot of it was for the camaraderie. He loved, he loved that. He was raised in Calgary, so moved back to Newfoundland when he was uh, nine, ten years old. And then once he graduated from high school, after a year of being out, he decided he wanted to um, do some exploring and go back to Alberta. So he went back there and lived with some friends of ours um, and uh, just uh, was trying to find himself. He worked lots of different jobs, laboring jobs, and uh, was just... Uh, his biggest, his greatest passion was martial arts, and that's what he wanted to do in Alberta. He wanted to train in different dojos and uh, do something in that field. That was his, his passion. On the evening of the accident was the first day of my holiday, and we received a phone call, which came from Brandon's uh, stepbrother. And uh, my first reaction was to just ignore that phone call because we had just sat down to have our supper and just so we'll call Jason later and then within a matter of minutes our both of our cell phones were ringing my daughter was FaceTiming me from Australia and there had been a very serious ac accident Brandon had been airlifted by stars in Alberta to the Foothills Hospital and that he was in very serious shape Brandon uh, had multiple injuries and he had uh, one of the most significant being traumatic brain injury. Um, he also had uh, what they call atlanto-occipital dislocation, which is the equivalent of a decapitation. Uh, and what I didn't know at the time was that most people do not survive that at the scene. They do not survive that. So fortunately for good frontline management, he survived that and made it to the hospital. Uh, 70 percent of people die on the scene and then we learned later that you know 15 percent die in emergency or ICU of the 15 percent who survive most are not rehabitable so Brandon defied medical science by his uh, remarkable recovery. I was in hospital in uh, Calgary for so long for nine months and uh, I moved to uh, Pinoca I lived in the elder uh, for 14 months, and uh, all I did there was rehab, 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 rehab. So then I walk, talk, and all that big stuff all over again. So uh, that's all I needed. That was my job. That day of my car crash, I don't remember that day at all. So the driver, uh, he had his own set of circumstances. I'm sure I didn't know him. Brandon didn't know him. He was. Uh, a friend of uh, Brandon's friends, um, and apparently nobody really knew that he had been drinking. You cannot change what happened in the past, so I really just have to, to let that go. I don't have any, I'm not angry towards him, I just feel like, you know, um, we had the best outcome that we could have possibly had in that situation, so I have to let that go, really. I would die because of a drunk driver off my ride saying to me you're sober, so please don't drink and drive and always watch who you get ride with because it's very scary. It's a scary world out there, very scary.
A group called Wheels for Wishes is doing a virtual car show to raise money for the CNIB. I'll tell you what they're doing and why. Coming up on Here and Now. Well, cool temperatures have been the story for most of the island and up through Labrador for the last couple of days. And unfortunately, that's going to stick around certainly as we head towards the weekend for the island. A little bit gray with the chance of some showers and a warm up on the way for Labrador. That is the story, though, as we head towards the early part of next week for the island. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up. This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast in a beautiful sunny evening uh, in St. John's right now. Yeah, it took a little while for that cloud cover to uh, taper off this afternoon. And then once that sun came out, felt pretty lovely. But if you're in the shade, it certainly feels cool. 
and that's pretty much what we're seeing across the uh, across the board really let's take a look at those temperatures only 15 degrees was the afternoon high in st john's although in that sunshine it certainly felt a lot warmer but temperatures uh, cool right across the board 16 degrees in cornerbrook the hot spot was in gander and churchill falls tied at 21 degrees uh, earlier this afternoon or and still is there uh, for gander but really that cloud cover like i mentioned did take a while uh, to go away but it's moving right back in as you can see starting to creep in and it will do so as we head through the evening hours in the next few hours but some showers on the go up through the northern peninsula and heading towards central as well that's pretty much what we're going to see as we head through the next couple of hours the temperatures have dropped a little bit only uh, 12 degrees in st john's right now 14 in corner brook and uh, temperature drop for gander down to 15 degrees right now so take a look at the future tracker you see some showers develop along the south coast even the risk uh, we could hear a few rumbles of thunder uh, for mainly the Conagra Peninsula, maybe towards the Buren, maybe Southern Avalon as well. But overall, uh, just the chance of some showers for the most part. That's going to spread across the island as we head through the overnight and into the early morning hours uh, with some drizzle on the go as well. 11 degrees will be the overnight uh, low for St. John's and then about 13 for Grand Falls, Windsor. Up through Labrador, uh, single digits for Nain overnight tonight, 8 degrees and 13 for Lab City, but generally those winds will be light for the big land. Now tomorrow it will stay unsettled, like I said. Potential we could even hear a few rumbles of thunder in the morning for eastern areas as you see some of that heavier rain moving through. That could be some thunderstorms. Uh, otherwise, a generally gray day. Might see a few, a few peaks of sun for uh, areas in the southwest, but uh, Lab City as well. Anywhere in the west, really up through Labrador, you're looking at the risk of thunderstorms and uh, generally gray for the rest of Labrador with the chance of some showers as well and these cooler temperatures are going to stick around as well only sitting in the mid teens for most maybe 15 16 degrees uh, 17 on the Avalon potentially otherwise temperatures in the low 20s through central and towards the west coast under generally gray skies uh, winds will be fairly light though for the west and about 20 kilometers per hour out of the southeast for areas in the east now up through Labrador temperatures in the teens high teens for the interior towards Lab West and uh, overall looking at the potential for a little bit of sunshine late day for areas in the southwest. Now as we head towards Friday, it is going to be unsettled and really the weekend looks fairly unsettled. More periods of rain moving in, maybe even some thunderstorms as well and then into Saturday as well, staying gray. You can see up through Labrador, things are going to clear out though for you. So that's certainly good news. Uh, temperatures will recover back into the 20s. Uh, otherwise, 19, 22 degrees. This is around seasonal for this time of year just a little bit below for areas on the Avalon about 19 degrees in St. John's we should be sitting around 20 21 degrees this time of year and into Saturday again staying gray with those temperatures fairly similar plenty of sunshine up through Cartwright though 19 degrees same thing for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City and that's where we're going to start to see some of that heat and a little bit of humidity make its way in. And that's unfortunately not going to happen for uh, St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland until we get into the beginning of next week. But by then, we're looking at plenty of sunshine at this point, 22 degrees. And then same thing for Central Newfoundland, a little bit warmer though by 25 by Monday. And then similar for Western, uh, we're looking at about 24 degrees for you. Some sunshine on play for Sunday as well. For Eastern Labrador, there's your temperatures, 24, 25, 29 degrees by Sunday. And again, the return of that heat and humidity, same thing for Western Labrador, but it does look like by Monday, things will start to get a little bit more unsettled. Had to share this great shot, a little bit of a break in the fog around Cabot Tower. The fog is beautiful, that's for sure. Riley sent us this lovely shot. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, that is gorgeous. Thank you so much, Ashley. You're welcome. Well, the CNIB is getting a big boost from some local car enthusiasts. Wheels for Wishes is looking to use a network of cars and trucks to raise $50,000, all for a buddy dog for a 10-year-old boy with vision and hearing impairments. Here now's Jeremy Eaton brings us that story.
they contacted me in December and they wanted to raise some money for a buddy dog here in Newfoundland. Even with COVID, they're determined they're going to raise $50,000 to get a buddy dog for a child with sight loss here in the province. This is my buddy dog and her name is Ivy. We can play fetch and hide and seek. She helps me. What sort of things does she help you with? The stairs and getting around easier. So a buddy dog is not a fully fledged service dog. Uh, basically what it is, is it's a dog who for whatever reason didn't make it completely through the guide dog training program, allergies, hip problems, whatever, but they're still a very well trained dog. Um, so the buddy dog offers companionship, uh, confidence building, uh, love and cuddles uh, to children and youth that have sight loss. <laughs> organization is Wheels for Wishes. It started last year as a part of a legacy project for a philanthropist named Brad Smith uh, who donated to a lot of local charities and um, he passed away so his wife Jackie decided that maybe it'd be something to uh, to try to do something that we could you know keep his memory alive. <laughs> Last year we had our first show, which of course we can't do this year because of social distancing and, and COVID-19. Uh, last year we had approximately 700 cars registered, which made us the largest car show in Newfoundland and Labrador. This year we're hoping that we'll be the largest car show in Newfoundland and Labrador online. Plus we'll do cruising because we care on August 29th. We'll leave from an undisclosed location so nobody that, that does the route knows. And uh, then we'll cross the city. We'll go in two directions so everybody passes each other and, and we'll have a, say, a moving uh, car show and we'll pass like all the first responders locations. So we nicknamed it Cruising Cause We Care and you can register online. We hope that everybody turns out and we hope to raise a lot of money for it. This one is, is really neat because he has the detachable. Well, right now online there's a virtual car show. The virtual car show does a couple of things. It gets people registered for the photo challenge, which we get people out driving. We get them to go in front of our sponsors. They have to take a picture of their car their truck, their Jeep, in front, of the, in front of our sponsor. They have to post it with the hashtags that we provide to them. So our sponsors get a little bit of love back from us. And then they get the, we ask them to tell us a bit about your car, do a video, because for someone who can't see, they still love cars. They, they see cars differently than we do. They feel the cars to see them. So when you go and you, you take your video, they actually hear, okay, it's, it's, it's a Jeep. It has big tires, it has a big engine. And we have a 2002 35th anniversary Camaro. Convert the important thing is that people buy into it because we can't do it alone. Like we have representation now. We have, you know, we have a Skyline, we have a Jeep. These are, these are clubs that are outside of, say, the, the people who sit on the board for, for Wheels for Wishes. And uh, no, I think everybody wants to partake. It, it's because we're, a, we're an inclusive event. We don't just do antiques. We don't do just muscle cars. We don't do just tuners. We want everybody to come. We want everybody to help. There's no best in show. Wheels for Wishes is trying to raise money for a buddy dog for a child so they can have a buddy dog like me. We ask that anybody can help us, help us. We have a 10 year old little boy who needs a buddy dog. So we got a job to do and we got a short time to do it. Come here. Good girl.
The province has seen some business closures since the pandemic began, but today the Canadian Federation of Independent Business is warning that many, many more could follow. The CFIB predicts that over 2,700 small businesses could close due to COVID-19, but it adds the number of closures could be as low as 1,400 or as high as 3,400, depending on how successful the economic recovery is in the province. So how are businesses faring right now? The CFIB says 60% of small businesses are fully open, 38% are fully staffed, and only 24% have normal sales. There is no doubt many businesses are suffering. And joining me now to talk more about this is the CFIB's Director of Provincial Affairs, Vaughn Hammond. So first of all, 2,700 businesses potentially closing. That seems like a really big number. How did the CFIB land on that particular number? Since the pandemic began, we've been working with our members through surveys and whatnot. And one of the things that we determined through our survey process is that uh, about one in six members right now are considering whether they're going to wind down their business or actually go bankrupt. So based upon that data, what we thought about was extrapolating it to the broader business population within the province and across the country. And we landed on a mid-range number of 2,735. What businesses are most at risk of closing? Those in the hospitality sector, uh, certainly those in the arts and recreation sector as well. So think gyms any kind of venues that would be theaters, those kinds of uh, those kinds of businesses. It's the businesses that are having a difficult time trying to deal with the requirements for physical distancing or, um, you know, the 50% capacity that kind of, or 50 people, that kind of uh, issue. Do we know how many businesses have already closed due to the pandemic? They look at it on a quarterly basis. The last quarter that I think we looked at or that's available is the fourth quarter of 2019. So up-to-date numbers are not available, but based upon our data and some things that we're looking at, we're trying to estimate or determine what the future may look like in the next little while. As you noted in your opening, it's um, yes, 60% of our businesses are open, but yet only a quarter of them are actually achieving the sales that they would have had this time last year. Um, if, you've, if people look around them, like not only in the Northeast Avalon, but throughout the province, they'll notice that there's less traffic around. So it's a challenge all around. What will it take for these businesses to stay open? The CFIB gave a range of numbers on the low end, a uh, possible 1,400 businesses could close. On the high end, around 3,400 businesses could close. What factors are at play there that could determine uh, what end of the range actually happens? It's going to be a combination of government support and certainly customer support. There's been a number of things that the federal government has done. Uh, the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy being one, the Canada Emergency Business Account being another. The Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program, that's the one that's problematic right now. What we know is that at this point, $2 million was allocated for that program. So let's try to get that in the hands of tenants so that they can pay the landlords. So that's kind of the big issue that you think is facing the businesses right now that could make or break. Revenues are always going to be an issue right now, um, but with the wage subsidy, the major cost of labor and trying to get people back to work, that's kind of sort of addressed. The next biggest cost is rent. Or so from that perspective, you know, when you consider a business that's trying to lease property to run a business, um, if that's your next highest cost, then let's help try to address that and do it effectively because right now it's not happening. Von Hammond, thank you so much for breaking it all down for us. Thank you so much. Well, even though more and more people are dishing out for home renovations, a local economist says there are many people experiencing sky high debt. On the heels of today's announcement about pension plans, here and now's Garrett Berry spoke with Larry Short about the local economy in a post pandemic world. Well, we are aware uh, for over the last number of years that many Newfoundland Labradorians have gone up, driven their debts up to all-time record high levels. That basically they've maxed out on their mortgage, they've maxed out on their home equity line of credit, and they've maxed out on their credit cards. So, so this downturn is catching um, many uh, individuals in the same way as, as it's caught the, the provincial government. It is a calamity that is on top of um, a, you know, a precipice. So it is not 
unsurprising that people are looking for other sources of income in order to either pay down their debts or take care of themselves during this downturn. It is interesting, however, because it's almost a series of, you know, it's almost a fractured uh, part of the uh, economy because parts of the economy are doing really, really well. Uh, the home uh, improvement uh, renovation area is booming. Um, uh, auto sales seem to be doing quite well. In fact, the biggest problem that we're hearing about is a shortage of vehicles, lack of inventory. Um, and home sales have actually picked up in numbers, if not necessarily amounts. So it may be just that particular part of society which had uh, been you know, leaning into the wind, uh, into the economic uh, growth that had been happening in the last number of years and now are caught uh, flat-footed. Coming out of the, the uh, COVID crisis is where, where we're really going to you know, see the test of the economy to see what's, what's really going to be showing there when, when the government pulls back from um, putting all the stimulus in that it has been uh, doing there. So in general, uh, things have actually been better than what we have expected to see over the last period of time. It depends then if commodity prices really start to come back. If we start to see iron ore pick up, if we see the price of oil get back up above $50, $55 a barrel, then there may be enough stability there in order to uh, carry the economy through into 2021, uh, 2022. And then from there, it'll be how the provincial government, what the budget looks like, what the, what potential tax increases are there and, and if there are any austerity programs. Well, today's COVID-19 briefing looks to be the last for Premier Dwight Ball. The new Liberal leader will be announced Monday. Ball finished today's session with thank yous to everyone responsible for putting together the weekly live stream, especially Dr. Janice Fitzgerald. Now, but before I conclude my remarks today, I want to make a presentation. I want to make this presentation to Dr. Fitzgerald on behalf of myself and my family and to all, and, and from all new Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. So let me get this. It's tucked away underneath this desk. <laughs> so the first thing is from one of my favorite companies. It's from the Newfoundland Chocolate Company. We've got an assortment <laughs> of bars of some of the sayings that we know, so I want to share this with oh. Dr. Fitzgerald and say thank you. Thank you very much. And there's one other gift that I would like to give to her today, which I also think is appropriate, and this is a street sign that she could put somewhere <laughs> in her favorite little tucked away spot, and it says Fitzgerald Way. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there you go. You for providing the waypoints for us throughout all of this. Thank you and so much. Before I conclude my remarks today, I want to thank every single Newfoundlander and Labradorian for the great work that you have done. And to quote a famous Newfoundlander today, I say, hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Stay safe, everyone.
learning more about the investigation into Nova Scotia's mass shootings thanks to newly unsealed court documents. CBC's Elizabeth McMillan has more. Several people told police that the man responsible for the shootings had false walls and hidden compartments on his properties. One witness told investigators that the gunman had a secret room at his denture clinic in Dartmouth. Another said he kept a high-powered rifle hidden in a workbench. Now, the names of the people who gave statements to police are still blacked out. One person who knew the shooter for nine years described him as a sexual predator. That witness also told police that he smuggled drugs and guns into the port pic area from Maine and that at one point he had thousands of Oxycontin and Dilaudid pills. The same person said the shooter would also talk about getting rid of bodies. The summaries of interviews show several people called the gunman abusive. They also said he was paranoid, controlling, and concerned about security on his properties. The information released came from interviews police used to convince justices of the peace to grant them search warrants to access the gunman's properties. The RCMP requested the information and search warrants be, be sealed. Now, CBC and other media have gone to court to request access. The judge in this case has said that some information will remain redacted because of the ongoing police investigation. There is a further hearing related to CBC's application to unseal the documents next month. Elizabeth McMillan, CBC News, Halifax. Well, as we reported last night, there will be a public inquiry into Canada's deadliest mass shooting. Victims' families gathered again today for a rally that was originally planned as a protest, but instead became a victory march. CBC's Shayna Luck has that story. The reunion was emotional, but for the first time in a long time, the emotions were good ones. It felt good when you got the news. That's about one of the best feelings I've had in three or four months. Jenkins lost his daughter Alana and son-in-law Sean McLeod. His family came here for one reason. Well, really, it's to thank the people at Bridgewater and that have marched before. The people of Nova Scotia who helped us get here. Uh, you know, those are the ones we really want to thank. Yesterday, the families learned of the federal government's decision. There will be a full public inquiry into the shootings, with the power to summon witnesses under oath and demand any documents the commissioners think necessary. This was not because of the government, right from Lenore's and right to the top of Bill Blair. This was because of the families, our determination, our drive, and the Nova Scotians, the Blue Nosers. All you guys that helped out. They marched to Province House, walking quietly with their thoughts, circling the building and returning to the waterfront. Charlene Bagley's mind was on her father, Tom. He was my father, my pride. He was my hero. The past week has wounded her again, but she believes the inquiry will help her heal. He's not coming back, and I know that, but at least now we hopefully can get the answers that the families need, and that's what I want it, so what we all want it, it's what our family members we lost would want. No Liberal politicians attended the rally from either the province or Ottawa. Nick Beaton, who lost his wife and unborn child, delivered a pointed message to both governments. Numerous these ones that are saying that they wanted it, they wanted it, they could have called for it, they could have stuck their neck out and said they wanted it, but they didn't. For now, the families wait for the results of the inquiry, however long that will take. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. Transport Canada investigation has found that several employees spread a racist and violent email and in doing so breached the government's code of values and ethics. Ashley Burke has more. Former Transport Canada employee Renee Suderick says it shouldn't have taken 12 years for the government to denounce a racist email she received. I think it's a national tragedy that it takes media exposure for the department to do the right thing. The email contains an offensive parody of a Frank Sinatra song. Strangers on my flight, turbans they're packing, wondering if they might plan a hijacking. It threatens violence against travelers wearing turbans. 
Last year, CBC News reported Transport Canada Superintendent Mark Haynes sent the song to colleagues in 2008 and wrote, This is great. They should play this nonstop at all airports. His department oversees the enforcement of Canada's no-fly list, which has been criticized for mistakenly flagging children as security threats. Now a report into the internal investigation reveals not one, but ten employees sent emails containing the derogatory song violating workplace policies. Transport Canada admits it knew about the email three years ago, but says it didn't look into it thoroughly until CBC's story, and said in retrospect this was an error which has been corrected with the latest investigation. Honestly, it's quite ridiculous, and that stuff sh it shouldn't, it shouldn't take a long time to deal with it. 22-year-old student Adam Ahmed and his two brothers' names have been on Canada's no-fly list since they were children. His family says the handling of the incident shows systemic racism exists at all levels of the department. It's loud and clear that they need to fix this stuff. They need to fix it so the public can trust them again, especially with sensitive issues like security. I mean, these are people that oversee security, oversee the list that my kids are on. Six employees who sent the email still work for Transport Canada. The department's now reviewing what disciplinary action it could take. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. The heads of Facebook, Amazon, Google and Apple appeared before U.S. Congress today. It's part of an investigation into market dominance in the tech industry. Some critics believe the tech giants have become so powerful they stifle competition and innovation and raise prices for consumers. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg told the Judiciary Subcommittee of Antitrust that his company isn't as powerful as many people say. Competitors have hundreds of millions or billions of users. Some are upstarts, but others are gatekeepers with the power to decide if we can even release our apps in their app stores to compete with them. In many areas, we're behind our competitors. The most popular messaging service in the U.S. is iMessage. The fastest growing app is TikTok. The most popular app for video is YouTube. The fastest growing ads platform is Amazon. The largest ads platform is Google. Lawmakers are trying to determine whether existing competition policies and antitrust laws are adequate for oversight of the tech giants or if new legislation is needed.
And before we finish tonight, Ashley is here with a weather wrap up. So Ashley, how are things looking in the next 24 hours? Well, unfortunately, these cool temperatures are going to stick with us a little bit below seasonal over the next few days. So tomorrow's looking a little bit gray. Could even hear a few rumbles of thunder in eastern areas of the island tomorrow morning. And again, temperatures uh, a little bit cooler. We should be sitting around 20, 22 degrees for this time of year. Uh, so just a little bit below that, certainly on the Avalon. And then as we head towards the weekend, it's looking like a warm up for the uh, Big Land. So that's certainly good news there. So that's your weather wrap up. Thanks, Ashley. And here's a dose of good news. A Vancouver woman whose teddy bear was stolen last Friday. The toy, which contains an audio message from the woman's late mother, is now back in her arms. I'm a bit of a pessimist, and though I tried to be optimistic, I kind of counted, as, counted it as a loss, in all honesty. I didn't think she would come back, but she did. She did, so I guess I was proven wrong. Two Good Samaritans returned the bear. They said they got it from the person who stole it. Well, it's just nice she got it back. Well, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. I hope you can join us again tomorrow night. Good night.